How do you feel about having art work in the street? Uh, I feel like art's important for everyone, like uh, from all walks of life, and it's uh, something as a human you should engage with while you exist. And for most communities, there is no access to art. People are like struggling and wanting to go get food and like hustling just to survive. So, like, they don't have the time in a day to worry to go like look at a gallery and look at pictures and let them see how it makes them feel and shit, you know, like, they, uh, street art's kiff because it gives art to the people and it's there. The, the practice of graffiti is like a footnote in the text of the city. It's there, but very often it is not seen. It is, I think it is an experimental collaboration among writers, writers as you, as us, as the architect, as the urban planners, as the walkers. Everybody is writing meaning all the time as we move through space. Stories, we like to do some graphics, you see, because we want to leave some memories, because we do believe we can't live here no more. You see, sometimes maybe after two weeks, I can take my ship to go overseas, you see. So if my young bra, he gonna come maybe after two years, when he come here and he gonna found my name to the wall, he even can feel my, so happy. And he say, ah, even my bra, he pass here. Okay, so even me too, I'm gonna go overseas. Because when we go overseas, we used to contact our brothers who are in Africa and just give them hope. It is a kind of intervention that is quite revolutionary because it provokes, it challenges the sovereignty of the wall as a static object which belongs to somebody. It challenges this kind of capitalist attitude of this wall and its polished plaster. And with this provocation, just like the grass, that the municipality will come with their poison and they will poison the grass because there's a fear about this provocation. Illegal graffiti is not only necessary, but it's a natural outburst. You know, it's a, it's a crying from inside to say that I won't really exist within this cage that you provide, you know. You're providing like a structure for me to say that I'm not allowed to advertise my own art, but you can use art to advertise to me and sell a product. And therefore you give rights to people who actually are selling something to use art and communicate, but you don't give rights to people who are communicating ideas and cultural, cultural values. People don't come, don't meet up with art. And uh, so art remains invisible and that which art represents remains invisible. And this is where this is very important. And I'm sweating. <laughs> I think artists should be given the opportunity to express themselves. For me, as a commuter working here every day, looking at the arts, it's something that I appreciate. I like this one. It's a, it's a woman, I think she's carrying Millie's. And I relate to Millie's, I love Millie's. When I look at the sign, I just miss home, I miss my gran, and I just, I just miss going to the garden and just being home. I don't know, uh, Durban Graffiti. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Durban, I shake my head. <laughs> really. <laughs> Bolivia, lots of street arts, lots of giant murals uh, with lots of social themes talking about indigenous rights, about women's rights, about things like seeds and anti-nuclear stuff, you know. Uh, and I find that that content is not really so prominent in street art here. Uh, or if it is, maybe it's hidden somewhere. <laughs> Americana Massacre is the most recent stain on the South African democratic dream. A group of a few thousand miners decided to put down their tools and not go to work. And they represented such a threat to whoever that South Africa's militarized police force was put into play and in like an incredible show of force live ammunition was issued and police officers from various tactical response units they're supposed to be the elites of the elites when it comes to crowd control opened fire on these striking miners I don't think people had ever considered that South African government would once again be responsible for the murder of its own citizens. I think what was most foul for people and for South Africa and for the nation was the idea that this, this wasn't linked to anything other than capital. The figure of the most famous sort of iconic image of the Marikana massacre was one of the strike leaders, a man from the Eastern Cape by the name of Mlineni Noki. He had wrapped himself in a blanket and it was a very striking green blanket and he stood at the head of the miners. This artifact has many meanings to it. For example, you can just see the, you can just assume that the person that they painted on the wall is uh, somehow an activist or freedom fighter. As you can see, the fist as a young person, African person, I am also facing my own struggle. So I think the race and somehow the struggles we are facing can be quite similar. One of the main functions of the arts is to make visible that which is invisible. What is invisible in our society? Uh, homelessness is invisible. The plight of the workers are often invisible, and Morikana amplifies that. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really important uh, part of art making. 
Ah, I would say maybe the most important part of art making. <laughs> Yeah, 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 like that there. That looks quite like cool, man. Something like that? Or maybe a little bit wider. You know, a lot of people put up a mask just for the rest of the world to be able to see and understand. And it's never really exactly who we are. It's always like a flavor of who we are, but who we want other people to see us as, you know? So at, at the end of the day, like, it also has to do with the multiple faces that people have in society. My campus, uh, they recently had an election. So when I saw that um, bef before the election, the SRC guys started to, to do things that they didn't do before just because they wanted our vote. So <laughs> We're in a society that actually, you know, is, everyone is behind some sort of mask and we identify better in a mask rather than being in our actual selves or who we are. So the thing is, they are heroes, but then they, they are just there for their own benefit. Okay. <laughs> so there are those people who are like silent, who, who like, you never see them, but then they, they play a, a huge role in your, in your life. Obviously, being that graffiti did come from, so to say, a westernized um, cultural viewpoint um, and also country, being black and doing this art form in Durban, it's, um, it's quite a standout because a lot of people don't think you can do it because a lot of people in my culture are not always accessible to this form of art or they're not necessarily exposed to what can happen and what are the possibilities with this sort of art. So my journey, it's, it's always wonderful, you know, I mean, it's, it, it changes over time depending on what I'm focusing on. We're never going to go and ask for a wall in Mplanga because, you know, you'd be like, wow, no one's going to give you a wall in Mplanga, you know? People will definitely give you a wall in the township. And you never stop to think about that whole sort of like skewed power relationship. White people can still walk around with a sense of I belong anywhere, I can be anywhere, I can speak anywhere, people must hear my voice, my voice has power, what I have to say is important, people must know that. This is all something that has become inbred in us as white people and it can find its way into our art as well where we just expect that people must respect what we do because we are artists, you know. Am I being careful enough about how I might be perpetuating privilege and power in the act of creating my art, especially with something as provocative and as public as painting. You know? I feel like I uh, painted graph for so long that it just became like, almost like I was on order. Didn't really have to think about it much, didn't have to sketch much. After a while it just becomes second nature. Making art walls or making stuff like that is something that I don't know, I think it, it takes a little bit longer, or maybe it comes more naturally to other people, I don't know, but it definitely didn't come naturally to me. I mean, who's to say when something worthwhile is gonna pop in my head, you know? Or in my friend's head. And then, yeah, every now and then, something will come up like this xenophobic issue, and then I feel like we need to speak out about it, you know? So. Painting walls is a lot of the time collaborative, or at least that's how it started. Um, it's not easy doing that with a lot of people, you know. Can only really do that with my close friends. 
Charlie, I think this is more like crown, eh? Is it? Yeah, that like... Um... Okay, cool. Up there, it looks amazing. If you can get it all looking like that, it looks great. And then somehow take the black and, and I don't know, make the words there. Or I don't know. Because I think there's like a good aesthetic that's happening here. Hey, I'm hanging out with my brothers, doing something meaningful. I like that. <laughs> I like the fact that it's so nature-based because a lot of street art is very angular, angular, and it's kind of this uh, hidden code, you know? That if you're not part of it, then it just becomes like a, like a child scribble or something like that. So we actually came up with the idea for this during the xenophobic story. Uh -huh. So it's, like, it's supposed to be like different I see. Birds or different types of yes. birds sharing yes. the same resource in a way. Sure. I do think that that won't be immediately perceived. Yeah. Uh, simply because, again, of this uh, separation complex we have, you know, we see our ourselves as humans and them as birds. Uh, maybe less than that being a particular kind of bird and this being a particular kind of bird. Uh, but I hope the message may, may, may makes it on some level. I mean, again, a, lo a lot of my stuff is very direct and in your face and call to actions and these kinds of things. And, uh, stuff like this can very often, on a subtle level, you know, really create that change that sometimes a direct and loud statement, you know, can, cannot. Yeah. We were, we were walking down the street, the street, when we were closing. Then we saw the paint on the wall. Then we started to read, yeah. It was written in English, share. Then in Zulu, what was it saying like? Aspan. Aspan. Yeah. Yeah. All those birds, each word means same meaning. Yeah, that name is called Goba. Goba means share. So we eat together in same bowel. We drink together as all Africans. So it's inspired, especially in art. Suppose art is nature and art is life. So we get inspired on that name. Uh, my grandmother was a domestic worker. So like every Friday we would move to, to the suburban areas. And on Monday we go back to Umlazi Township. So like I've always been confronted by these two spaces. And only now I'm beginning to actually inv investigate this thing artistically. The image that stands out from my work is the vulture. Because, like, that's how I perceive the black elite political figures and businessmen. Metaphorically speaking, I see them as vultures because they feed off poor people. They, you know, like, they, they, subject them, they subject them into, like, silly things and you know, like if you're looking to the working class and all these things, and it's only a few that benefit from what is created. for the location that they are at, especially Robin's one at the end. Okay. Yeah. Because it's talking about plastic. And if there's one thing we're very much known for is we litter. And we don't pay much attention to how it affects the city um, in the long term and even in the short term. Because most of the time when people look, they're, they're expecting something that's advertising something. So they will ask themselves, what are they trying to advertise towards us right now? 
female artists are being given the platform that male artists have, you know, had the privilege of enjoying for quite a while. I don't know what it is, but I think it's just that maybe now girls just can't shut up about what they do. And I think that's a good thing and people are starting to take notice of it. So and I think in terms of mural art, it would be the same thing where also maybe it's because mural art is mostly in the streets and it's not exactly the safest places for women to be. But it would be very interesting to see women take up more of an agency to insert themselves in those situations unapologetically. <laughs> Maybe you get a little clip of the sketch, it kind of inspired the world, too. Yeah, that'd be cool. Next up. Painting. How many have you done? Three or four mirrors I've done in the green camp. Which animals did you have you painted? Um, monkey, rabbit, chameleon, and rhino. Which is your best? Which is your best painting? The monkey. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and this for me is probably the most amazing part of the mural. <laughs> it's yeah. how the, the trees and plants have just kind of um, added themselves to it already. <laughs> I started doing a bird somewhere there and then I was like, oh, this looks terrible. And then Lee came along and he was like, hey, why don't you do it like this? And so we, we tried that and it became a little collaboration between myself and, and Lee um, uh -huh. within a bigger collaboration. So yeah. Yeah. It's about those little things that we learn from each other that are um, unique and meaningful. You know, we all came here and we built something together and then we left and everyone left with something that is lived, a lived experience within them that's unique to them. Yes. And I, I think you know, that, is the, that is the meaning of it and the real meaning of collaboration. It's not really about you know, what you, yes. you see here, although this is beautiful and yes. um, important. It was almost necessary for sand people to document hunts and um, animals they had seen in certain caves so that the next group of nomadic people who came through there would understand what had already happened in that area. And it was always a form of historical writing. You're writing history when you're painting a mural because you're taking a moment in cultural history, in popular ideas and visual media, and you're using materials that are obviously from a specific age. You know, so as soon as, as soon as you lay paint to a wall with an idea or an intent for that matter, you're actually documenting history. We are now at Ilens Cave, which is found at, in the Dema Special Conservation Area. The people who used to live here, the Abatwa or the Sand people, 
They were called as stock thieves in the southern Drakensberg. What black and white people started to fight against them. Lots of them, they ran up the Lesotho mountains towards Namibia, Kalahari. We've got all the paintings, they are older than 2,000 years. They're very old, but around here there's lots of red colors. They made it from Elan's blood and fats, mixed up with the iron oxide just found from the ochre stone, and then mixed up with the fats as well. And Elan's hairs were used as the fine painting brushes. We've got the Elan, wherever you go, there's a picture of the Elan. Why the Elan? It's because it was the favorite animal of Karen, the goddess of the sand people. Only the shaman can do the painting. It's all about their lifestyle and history during those days. No more pushments, only the descendants like Duma people. Okay. Yeah. Duma. Yeah. My grandfather is Kekel Movu Duma. And to find out that today oh, yeah. the Dumas are the descendants of the Khoisan. And you know, like I've always been wondering like, why am I getting all these like, you know, like no one ever painted at home. Maybe, I don't know, bro, I'm just making crazy links here now, bro. This is amazing. I'm catching goosebumps here, bro. Yeah. We've been trying to just figure out if there is any connections that we can, or any parallels that we can draw between what we see here and what we've been doing uh, in the urban areas. Uh, obviously, there's a 2,000 years um, time difference between what we from this work to what we've been doing. Um, it seems clear that this work performed a, a very important function for the for the for the society that the, the, the artists were a part of. Um, and yeah, I think the work that we do isn't really performing such a such an intrinsic function that this work did, but it's almost like something that we're aiming towards, you could say. That we're inspired by this work and the value of this work and also to see how valuable artwork like this is for the people in the future. So to, to, to represent um, the society that we're from on the walls it's valuable and in the future who knows maybe people would take a long journey just to see our work although i'm not so sure oh yeah i don't even know if our work will last as long as this because these guys works lasted some of them over two thousand years our work lasts like a couple of years and we're happy so yeah <laughs> Sometimes I stand like uh, near this box and I look at these pictures. Mm. My stress mm. is going mm. out from my mind. Yeah. Hey, hey. It's, it's, <laughs> because good. stress is disturb my mind. It's sure, it's yeah. good. There's another reason I'm staying like this because of stress and status. Sure, it's sure. I understand that. But... Wow, art is definitely therapy. I think one of the reasons why I create art is for something more personal than uplifting because like I have to deal with my daily battles and I think just art being there is the, my biggest therapy like I don't do anything mm. else no like mm. alcohol or cigarettes or anything I just like do art mm. bro so like that's that's like my thing dude just gotta keep focused and hopefully one day it's gonna flourish and give us a future so yeah <laughs> Oh, mm -hmm.
Yeah, yeah.